Welcome to Uncontained, episode 167. I'm your host, Aaron Static Render, and on the show today, I speak to stand up comedian and also creator of the animated series Fits, Sean Connor. Sean was referred to me by a past guest of Uncontained, stand up comedian Max Goldman, and And I always appreciate when I get a referral sent my way because typically it's going to be a good interview, especially if it comes from somebody I've already had on the show. And today is no different as I speak to Sean Connor. uh, We talk about his animated series that he's working on and currently pitching to uh, networks called Fits. And it has kind of an Aqua Teen Hunger Force vibe to it. And uh, yeah, and he's pitching it to all the right places like Cartoon Network, Adult Swim, and other streaming services. We'll get into how that works in the show a little bit more in depth for people who are looking to pitch stuff. And we also talk about his stand-up comedy as well and, and how he brings himself into his stand-up. I had a blast talking to Sean in this episode, and I can't wait to see which network picks up his animated series, Fits. And before I jump into this show, I want to thank you for supporting Uncontained by listening, and also for those of you who have made their way to uncontainedpod.com and clicked the Amazon banner at the top of the page, or uh, checked out TeePublic to uh, get some uncontained merch. I really appreciate the support, and uh, thank you. I won't keep you waiting any longer, and uh, this is my conversation with comedian Sean Connor. How are you doing today, Sean? And what's up, man? I'm doing good. Glad to hear that, and thank you for sticking with me through all the technical difficulties. I like I like to let people know that they're here on the show because, like, if somebody else wants to create something and it's not going smoothly, it happens a lot. <laughs> no, no, I definitely appreciate. I definitely can appreciate that. Now, I, I had no problem. You know, I understood. I was like, all right, well, you know. I'll just uh, I'll take part in my vices, and then as soon as he's ready, I'll be ready to go. All right, perfect, man. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. So you were actually recommended to me as a guest from a former guest of mine, uh, Max Goldman. Yep, yep, yeah, yeah. Max is my homie. Uh, I met Max probably when I first moved out to Los Angeles. He was always working at the comedy store. I don't know what it is about Max, but he just loves black people. Uh, but he's 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 not like a he's not like a a, a a black white person. You know, he's he's very he's very who he is. I met his family. He fits right in there. You know, they they match. But uh, for some reason, he just has an affinity for black people. And I, and I tried to question it, and he made me feel bad for questioning. He was like, "What do you mean? I can't just like all people." And I was like, "All right, my bad. Sorry." I didn't know. I, I, I didn't know pulling the race card on him. He's such a good person. He flipped it back on me. So that's just a testament to who Max is. <laughs> right on, man. Max is a good guy. It was a fun interview to have with him, Max, and um, he's on the um, Crack 'Em Up yep, Thursdays, yeah, yeah. right? Crack he works with Thursdays, those guys. Yep. yep. Have you uh, done any work with those guys at all, or? Uh, I go to the show all the time. It's a, you know, it's a. It's a bit of a networking system, but uh, I'm at the comedy store usually on Fridays. There's a guy named John Campanelli uh, out from New York, but uh, he does a show there once a month, and he always lets me get up at his show, so, you know, testament out to him. But uh, Crack 'em Up Thursdays, you know, it's, it's a great show, uh, and the podcast is always funny. I'm always down there hanging out, you know, kicking it with the comedians, and, you know, we work together, and we always see each other at other shows. But uh, I haven't been on the show yet, but I'm looking to on in the future. Okay, all right, cool, man, because uh, that seems like a very cool podcast, too, because uh, they record a podcast with, like, a stand-up comedy show, for those who aren't familiar. I'll go ahead, check them out. It's it's Crack 'Em Up, and it's Crack 'Em Up Thursdays, is it? Yep, at the Comedy Store in the Belly Room. All right, if you're in L.A., give the show a plug, too. Go check it out, Thursday nights in the Belly Room, like you said. All right, so uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, you, man. So how long have you been doing stand-up comedy for? So I've been doing stand-up for, it's coming up, uh, I would say, about seven years this summer. Uh, you know, I, I did it for about five years on the East Coast, you know, New York, Atlanta. I, I used to live in New Jersey, so all up and down the East Coast. And after about five years of, you know, getting comfortable in the clubs, 
decided to come out here and to LA, you know, start the LA grind. And, and I, I feel like it's, uh, it's been working out for me. You know, when you first start out in any city, you got to hit the open mics. You got to get your face out there. But I, I've kind of moved up to the level where, you know, I'm in the clubs now on Saturdays and Friday nights and I'm throwing my own shows around the city. And it's just it's all a grind and it's all putting in the footwork, but it, it, it's, it's starting to work out for me. All right. Perfect, man. So what would you say the biggest change in comedy from East Coast to the West Coast is? Uh, I would say the alertness of the audience like. Out here in L.A., the audience is coming to hear your jokes and they're coming to see your show. And that sways the comedy sometimes. That makes the comedy more, you know, story like and more uh, more of character driven uh, okay. on the East Coast. They're coming for not necessarily your jokes, but are you funny? And I know that's almost the same thing. It sounds weird to say it like that, but it's yeah. just like act a, act a fool up there. Amuse us. Not necessarily uh, give us, you know, your monologue or give us your 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 whole bit that you came up with. I feel like on the East Coast, I used to call them uh, hell rooms because especially where I was from in New Jersey, it wasn't necessarily a comedy scene. So doing okay. comedy there, it's like you're doing it at uh, maybe a poetry event or maybe in some bar where those people just came there to drink. They didn't come here to hear comedy. So now you're forcing your jokes down their brain or down their, you know, down their throat. And eventually you might, some nights you might have to say, man, forget this material. I got to just talk about what's in front of me. And that's a lot. I, I see that a lot on the East Coast, but on the West Coast, people are coming like, okay, let's, let me hear what you got. Let me see your best. And they want to see your best over here. Okay. All right. And from, from the sounds of it too, like, I, I don't know what I was picking up where instead of coming to hear you jokes or coming to like, you better be funny. Is it more that they're expecting physical comedy out there too? Like, you know how you see, see like some comics do a lot of acting out jokes. Is that more helpful in like New York? Definitely. Definitely. In New York, uh, I would say acting out the bit and just using, you know, the, the props around you, the stool, the, the mic stand, the stage, if there's anything above the stage, just uh using your environment with action, like you said, just acting out. Yeah, that's definitely that definitely helps you more uh, on the East Coast and, and just sitting back and being, you know, laid back and a little more methodical. It really helps you on the West Coast because the, I, I feel like a stand up. It is kind of like a roller coaster. You know, the best comedians, I feel like, can take you up and down to where. They'll draw you in with a real quiet, subtle, you know, setup, and then can finish real high and, you know, things like that. Yeah. Whose comic style do you think you try to emulate? Hmm. See, it's, it's, uh, no, not, not, not imitate, but emulate. I, I definitely get what you're saying because I'm definitely inspired by other comedians, but the comedians that really inspired me are kind of like just people that I've seen. I don't know, coming up through the scene that I felt like were really original. I it, Audience can always tell when a person's kind of being honest when you're up there. Because, like, your persona only lasts for, like, five, ten minutes. After that, you, you run out of character. Char caricature. I can't even say the word, but you get what I'm saying. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> uh, uh, you run out of that, I feel like, or, or when it comes to stand-up. So, like, after a couple minutes of that, you know, people will get bored with you. They'll look at their phone. You know, some people might walk out the show. But if if you really want to get into that next level of stand up, you got to get into the honest truth of who you are because people are gonna be able to feel that. And and that's just the uh, what I look for in a comedian. So to answer your question, people like Corey Holcomb, he cracks me up. I see him a lot in L.A. Uh, I feel like you know he's brutally honest. He doesn't hide who he is. Uh, of course, you know, the legends like Chappelle, I still love Louis CK, he cracks me up, Bill Burr's <laughs> one of my favorites. Um, for old school, I like this guy, he's really not heard of, but this guy, Godfrey Cambridge, I love him. Not uh, just Godfrey, right? No, no, not Godfrey, not the African guy, this guy's probably in the 60s, Godfrey Cambridge. Uh, I okay. love, I love, uh, Greg Warren, I love Mike Birbiglia, um... John Mulaney cracks me up. Theo Vaughn. Like, I, I, it's a whole bunch of people that I feel like when I see him, I can watch all their clips for hours. Cause I'm just like, damn, he's really just being who he is on stage. And I love the honesty, truth, and when people can be funny like that. 
Nice, nice. And okay, so we we'll come back talk about comedy a little bit more too. But I, I want to get to this. You sent me a video today of something that you're working on yep. an animated show. I, I don't know, maybe talking about uh, character or something made me think of it right away. But when you were talking about doing character, uh, being a character on stage, now when I watched it, like I. I didn't quite know what to expect from the description you gave me. <laughs> it's yeah, like yeah, archetypes yeah. as clothes. And then I was like, dude, this has a very almost Aqua Teen Hunger Force vibe to it. <laughs> word, word, word. <laughs> that's, uh, that's definitely what we're going for. Kind of like a, uh, uh, a portrayal of uh, real situations through crude animation. But we're trying to make sure that the writing is top notch. But uh, basically yeah. to explain the idea... If you know the the old saying is uh, make sure the man makes the clothes, make sure the clothes don't make the man. But uh, ah. uh, this is this is kind of flip on that of saying like, what if the the clothes that we wore actually portrayed who we were? So the uh, the the main character is a pair of blue jeans, and his name is uh, Blue Jean Fitzgerald. He's a, a a Jewish white kid, and he hangs out with this streetwise black kid, Skinny Blackman, and they also okay. hang out with a uh, a short pair of shorts, Daisy Duke. And, you know, it's just their coming of age story of trying to make it in Hollywood and their and their, you know, uh, specific uh, genres of creation. Uh, Blue Jean works in music and uh, Skinny's a comedian. You saw that in the clip. And then Daisy Duke is a makeup artist. So, you know, they're just going through dealing with janky promoters, uh, dealing with one of them catching a big break and the other one's kind of getting jealous, dealing with will they won't they uh, when it comes to love attraction between Blue Jean and Daisy. It's a uh, pretty uh, in-depth look of what what I what I like to call archetypes of who humans are or who we try to portray them as when we see them in these certain types of clothes. Yeah, I never really thought about like if you actually had pants that really made you a certain attitude or something <laughs> like you know, like right. I'm putting on my bitch pants. Wait, no, right, don't do exactly. that. <laughs> don't put your bitch pants on tonight. <laughs> Nobody Definitely. needs that. <laughs> All right, so yeah, it's. Are, are, do you do the illustrations as well, or? Uh, yeah. So I. Uh, or animations. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I I, uh, I write it. You know, I design the characters. I uh, I animate it, and and I am in the process of looking for a second animator because I don't want to do all of that. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but for pitching purposes, it's a uh, it's it's uh it's just a way to get the idea out there and. Uh, I, I I know that when the right time comes, I'll meet the right people that'll help make it better. Of course, of course. And do you do all the voices on it too? No, 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 no. I got a a, a wide cast of comedians that I see at the comedy store, the ha ha, just out here on the LA scene. That you know they they don't mind coming by to do a favor, you know, to to do a voice on my cartoon. Very cool, man. Very cool. Because I was going to say that was one amazing Jamaican lady voice that you had in that <laughs> clip. <laughs> right. I wish I had that talent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll have to put a link to that in my uh, show notes so people can uh, check that out and see what we're talking about right there. So, what, okay, cool. What was the inspiration to. Uh, to make this animation have you always wanted to get into doing like animated shows or uh yeah i as I, I would say my first noticing of i wanted to do cartoons was like in the third grade i wasn't paying attention in class but i would always doodle uh these certain characters i do you remember the show rocco's modern life yeah yeah all right so they were these side characters called the fatheads and i felt like they should have had their own show there were these green monsters, and I, I guess the little pervert in me remembers them because anytime Rocco <laughs> would get knocked, you know, across in the air and he go flying, he would land in this lady's titties, and she would go, "How dare you!" But uh, that was th that lady was uh, the wife of the fatheads, and I just always remembered those characters, and I would always do it on and say, "Man, they should have their own show." And I always wanted to do cartoons, but I didn't get into it till about three years ago. And how it happened was, uh, I'm doing stand up, and I'm preparing to move to L.A. And I broke my leg. And I broke my leg being a uh, a young drunk asshole. So there's no reason to feel sorry for me. But I was okay. uh, <laughs> I, I was gonna do the ah, but no, 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 no like no. serves you right. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, I had I, I broke my leg on Christmas, so I just had too much fun, and uh, you know I, I deserved it. But um, that that stopped me from moving to L.A. And I was so bedridden that I was like, man, once I got over watching anime and jerking off, I need something else to do. So I got into, uh, I, I got into, uh, you know, 
animation and everything was terrible. Like I couldn't do any walk cycles. I couldn't draw at all. I had no idea what perspective was like, but then, you know, I decided that I always had this idea of clothes as cartoons. But I decided that to put in time, I wanted to come up with, you know, 10 shows that I would consider my practice shows. And I knew I would put these shows out and they would suck. And everybody would be like, what is this? And But each one progressively, you know, just got better and better. And uh, these were shows like they're on my YouTube page. And, you know, you can look at at it as Shawnee Mac Comedy. But, like, it's stuff like uh, All My Ninjas, Retired Rappers, uh, (laughs) trying to think, Rock, Paper, Scissors, which was kind of like a remake of The Three Stooges. Um, it was, it's, it's, it's more of them and it's, uh, it's like shorts of like black versus white basketball, kid getting caught jerking off. Like it's a, it's a whole bunch of just almost very channel one on one ish. Do you know, you know what that is? Oh, is that like the, the channel that was broadcast during like school? No, no, no. That's PBS, PBS. Uh, that was channel one oh, or okay, something okay, like okay. that, but no, never mind. I'm, <laughs> no, I'm no. way off. What's channel one Oh one. Uh, you know, Dan Harmon. Yeah. All right. Of course. So after Dan Harmon, uh, you know, com- community was a big success. He, uh, he decided to start his own, you know, I would say film festival, I would say, but they do it once a month in, a in Hollywood at a movie theater where they show, you know, pitches. And it's basically kind of like, everybody in the industry judging if your show should actually be a show and uh that's where stuff like uh house of cosby's was first saw justin roiland show or like uh just just a whole house bunch of, of cosby's you never seen that one <laughs> i haven't no oh have man to check that's that out. classic house of cosby's is a classic so i can quickly explain the premise this huge guy who was a huge stand-up fan loved bill cosby at one of his shows found a hair and builds a cloning machine and starts making clones of Bill Cosby to have the father he never had. So each <laughs> Cosby progressively gets worse and worse and worse until he gets to 10 and 10. Each 10th Cosby is a super Cosby. But uh, it's it's a hilarious show where Justin does all the voices for the Cosbys. And it's just it just goes to show that, that, that that's a creative ass guy. man. He's funny as hell. All right, I'll have to I'll have to check that out. I almost thought like House of Cosby's House of Cards. Oh, uh, word, word, word. Like, <laughs> like something like that. That's what I was. That's what I was picturing. But this is like a multiplicity almost. Yeah, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Definitely, I'll have to check it out though. House of Cosby's. So, <laughs> all right, continue. I'm sorry to distract you on the House of Cosby's rant, but you were talking. We were talking oh, about how, your oh, show. Oh yeah, how how I got into animation. My bad. <laughs> So, yeah, Yeah. after I broke my leg, you know, I I did the practice shows and I decided that, you know, I felt like this show was a a show that was was worthy of doing. So I put together five short five minute episodes and I pitched to Adult Swim last year and they hated it. Well, well, basically, (laughs) basically, they told me basically they told me, uh, you know, it's a great idea. But if you can't do it right, there's no need to do it. And then so, you know, I I went back to the drawing board, started again and pitched to him again. And they said it still was terrible. But they said it's not the idea and it's not the story. It's the writing or the jokes. So then I decided to get with somebody who uh, was a better writer than I and who had more structure than I had. And I also okay. decided to uh, do a little bit of research myself like I I. I dove into Joseph Campbell's uh, Hero of a Thousand Faces, and that is a dense-ass book. Like, you have to be a, a real theologian to understand that. So I decided to read a story by Robert McKee, which was a little more, <laughs> was, which was a little more, you know, my my pace. Uh, did you get it? Did you did you finish the book or did you just get into it and be like, man, this is just too much? Oh, oh, um, Joseph Campbell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I probably got to like page twelve and I was like, man, I'm not. I didn't retain anything. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so fair enough. So I uh, uh, I I read a couple more books and I, I and it really helped me understand you know structure and actually what these characters are supposed to be doing and it and it helped me uh, understand. You know how to construct story better. So when I'm putting jokes in, it's not just stuff flying in and random things happening. And I think that that's the uh, the real turning point to where I was like, all right, this show could you know really be something. And then I pitched to uh, MGM, and MGM said, all right, we like the idea. We just want to see a full pilot because really all the companies now there's no more development of ideas. They just want you to come with the finished thing, and if they like it, they'll buy it. And then I pitched to Adult Swim, and they said the same thing. Like, yeah, you got something here. 
let's see if you can make it. And then, you know, we'll just we'll tell you where we put it. We'll give you an offer. So that's where I'm at in the uh, the, the production stage. Uh, very cool, man. So you've you've actually been getting it in front of executives. And like, even though some of them have told you you told you it sucked you brought it back and worked on it enough till till now they're actually interested that's really cool yeah yeah definitely so in i'm, I'm kind of curious about the shopping process of shopping your show in front of a in front of uh different studios yeah like so, how do you go about getting in front of like the adult swim execs so both both of them were uh both of both of those companies were very very different but it's just like uh, I would say a lot of the companies out here, everybody's trying to get into streaming now. So everybody wants to produce their own content. So a lot of people are hungry for content. So the barriers to pitch now are very low. And you know what that does. That's that's a double edged sword to where everybody can pitch. So, so a lot of a lot of BS is going to make it through. And but it's also yeah. easy to get there. So with Adult Swim. They've turned it into once a week. They have a TV show uh, that they live stream online where they take pitches. And all you have to do is pretty much you video chat with them and you pitch right there on the live stream. You send them, a, you know, your link of your pitch Bible or of your of your clip or whatever. And they and you watch people get deals right there online. And it's really? like, yeah. And they do it every Thursday at the same time. Uh, two two same guys and they're always cool or not it's not like uptight or I've even seen sometimes they're in the middle of a pitch and Mike Lazo the you know the president he just calls over and he's like yeah I like that idea you know tell him you know we want to meet with him yada 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 and it happens like that but um wow with MGM it it was a little bit more I had a connection and it was because I had pitched to a production company called Studio Seventy One. And the person that I pitched to was their creative director. And she told me also the same thing, like the writing needed to be, to be better. And maybe I should get with a writing team. And, and I, you know, I understood that. And, uh, she, it was a, a year later, she got a position at MGM and I told her about, you know, I worked on it. I got with the writer and me and the writer went and met with her. And then, you know, she let me, uh, that's when she explained to me that they're starting their own, you know, streaming service and they're looking for something that's the next. F is for family or the next Bojack Horseman. And they're, and you okay. know, they're looking to create their own content. And that's when she let me, uh, uh, she introduced me or we met with the, uh, the head of creative content at MGM and they told me, yeah, we want to see the finished product and you know, we'll, we'll let you, we can go from there. That's cool, man. So the streaming has actually made it easier to at least get in front of people, maybe not get, get a deal or anything like that, but at least get seen. I'll say that it has lowered the value of the deal, but it is easier to to get seen. Yeah, yeah. So that's really cool, dude. Um, can people see episodes of uh, Fits now? Uh, no, no. But you, you, I mean, you can ask when. I, it'll be done. You know, the episode will be done uh, July first. And if it doesn't, if it, if neither of the companies, uh, you know, decide to pick it up, uh, I am gonna put it out independently i do have some other ideas of shopping it but if if none of those fall through i am gonna go with amazon prime uh because that's okay. that's just you know me putting it out and i and it'll be uh, a full season it'll be 10 episodes and it, it'll just be a dollar each but if if it doesn't get picked up by i would say the end of the year then that will be probably my option with it very cool so you have a backup plan on yeah, that yeah, as definitely. well so um, I did notice in the in your in your cartoon you have uh, some stand up in there from uh, from uh, the pants character that that you are. Are yeah, you going to yeah, be right. in what What's the pants character's name again? I'm sorry, I forget. Uh, Skinny Blackman. Skinny Blackman. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um. So, I, are you going to be incorporating a lot of uh, stand of your stand up into into the cartoon? Well, actually, the uh uh. That that character is no longer played by me. Uh, okay. A a more the character will stay a stand up comedian, and he you know that will be his 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 driving characteristic, I guess, his identity until he finds his essence. Uh, but 
it's going to be played by, I can't announce who it is yet because we still have to, you know, pay this person. But it's going to be by a, a, a bigger name comedian that will help the draw of the cartoon. <laughs> Oh, really? Okay. Very cool. Look forward to hearing who that is. And uh, damn non-disclosure agreements and stuff like that also. You know, they, they always make it hard for interviews. <laughs> They're like, yeah, I know you know something. Tell me something. I can't. Uh, but uh, all right. So that's cool. You're actually getting some names, even though undisclosed, attached to this project. That's that's the cool thing. Not to cut you off, but that's the... That's the cool thing about being uh, just in L.A. doing stand-up. Like, in New York doing stand-up, sometimes it's cold. People don't want to stand outside and talk. And, like, uh, you know, it's just way more of a relaxed vibe in, L- in L.A. to where if, if I see a big name in a comedy club and I get off stage, he's more likely to just be like, hey, kid, good set tonight or something like that. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? I'm not just a comedian. I do this as well. Would you like to be a part of this? And nine times out of ten, when you come at it like that, you know, in this business, one thing that you notice is it's real competitive. Uh, stand-up comedians are always looking at other stand-up comedians like, well, if he gets a break, then that might not be my break. And that's that's not really how I look at it. But because I know that that's the game, I try to find a back door into this business. And that's where I feel like the cartoons comes in. Because when I talk to other stand-up comedians and they find out that I do animation, they now see me as an asset instead of, you know, competition. It's like, oh, okay, maybe he can do, maybe he can animate some of my bits. Maybe I can be on one of his cartoons. Anything is a possibility at that point. So that's just how I uh, I chose to, you know, strategize myself in the game. Definitely, dude. And, you know, that's kind of what I, you know kind of the same concept I have with this podcast here too. You know, I love doing the podcast, but meeting people, talking to people and then letting them know that, Hey, like some, I want to get into doing voiceover and characters and stuff like that, you know, it could open some doors for you down the road yeah, definitely. and stuff. So, and then it also is a way to get advice from people without, you know, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. I feel you. No, no, no. Right I, I get you because uh, people always, are going to, for the most part, <laughs> present their best selves to you. At least while you're recording, they're not going to be uh, a fucking asshole or just like, you know, a jerk or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, definitely, man. So since I do use this to, like, get advice from people, you know, and get advice for people listening, what advice do you have for people who are looking to either get into stand-up comedy or animation? Uh, I would say... It's okay to suck, (laughs) but be honest with yourself. You know, if you're okay with sucking, anything that you put energy to is going to grow at least a little bit. And you just got to be happy with where you are. Like, you can't be, I'll be happy when I get this, or you'll never be happy. But I I would just say, for advice, it's okay to suck as long as you're getting better. Uh, (laughs) I like that. Just try to get better a little bit every day. And eventually, you know, after a year, two years, five years, you'd be like, damn, I was really I'm really good. And you'll still and you're still going to think that you suck. But when you look back at where you were two, five years ago, you'd be like, yo, that person sucked. At least I'm not that bad. Like and then, <laughs> and then you put in a little bit more time and you'll see other people be like, hey, you're pretty good. I'm going to start doing it. And then they're going to suck. And then you're going to see like, oh, man. I do know a little bit and then it just all it's all in the details and work ethic. But, you know, that like everybody knows the right answer. I feel like I just feel like it's just hard to do that. shit. (laughs) (laughs) It is. It is a lot easier than said. And, (laughs) you know, and it does always it's especially hard when you're going through that sucking phase, you know, hell yeah. And you're like, you're like, I know I can do it. I know I can get get that joke down get that joke to land or whatever but it's like the crowd's not doing it's not as funny as it is in your head at that moment (laughs) right you know what helped me a lot i i will say this like i i hated it then but it's kind of like i'm thankful for it now when i broke my leg it was almost like six months of doing nothing and besides the sucking at cartoons you know i taught myself like scales and how to play a couple songs on the piano and realizing that like 
on the first day, I was terrible. And then on the second day, I was okay. And on the third day of practicing, I was pretty good. And then on the fourth or fifth day, they were like, you know, a lot of people will be like, yo, I know that song. And I'll be like, damn, this didn't take nearly as long as I thought it would. And all it was was consistently, you know, doing something. And that's when it clicked in my head that as long as you're hitting the stages and working on your material, you're going to get better. And if you're not doing that, when you go finally to do it, you're going to be rusty because you haven't hit the punching bag in a while. But as long as you're consistent and truth, that, that's the one thing, truthful about who you are. Because if it's not for you, it's not for you. And you'll know if it's not for you if you don't want to do it when it's not fun. Like, yeah. if you don't want to do it when you're not getting the praise for it, then it's not really for you. Because then you don't really deserve it, I feel like. Definitely, definitely. And, you know, you can do it for a while if that's the case. But then, like, after a while, you'll just end up falling off and not doing it. It's kind of like a New Year's resolution. Like, <laughs> exactly. at, the, at the beginning of the year, you're hitting the gym. Then by the third of the month, you're like, nope, I'm done. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, you know, if you're not you, – if you don't have that drive to do whatever it is that you're doing, not just stand-up comedy, not podcasting, but it could be, you know, just that corporate banker's job, you'll burn out. Well, I hate to uh, sound pretentious, but the one thing that I did get from Joseph Campbell was follow your bliss. And I kind of understand that, like – when you're doing something that genuinely makes you happy, like with stand up, I if I get a, if I go out and, you know, it's 500 people in the crowd, I know I'm most likely going to do well because it's so many people that some of them are going to laugh. And if some of yeah. them laugh, the other ones are going to be like, all right, I don't want to be out the loop. And then you got a good fighting chance. But I get the same joy of, you know, being in a bar with five people and I can make all five of those people laugh. I'm like, man. It is, I, what I'm saying is real because I don't even know y'all and y'all get it. Like they, it make that <laughs> that that's what I'm saying. Where that's not monetary success. That's not a success that you can calculate or count. But just that feeling of like, yo, I'm doing what I like and I can figure out my life doing what I love. And so it's like, damn, like that that feeling is worth. I think following your bliss, and I think that's what keeps people going in life. Because some people make a uh, million dollars at that corporate job and are sick in their head like they hate every day they hate their family they resent and then you know uh, it's it's a, life is just you know it's crazy yeah dude definitely and i i totally relate with that uh feeling of chasing your bliss and uh getting that from on stage i actually just recently like on actually april 27th on my birthday i got back on stage and did stand up for the first time in like oh, nice. three years four years since i since i started this podcast because i've just been focusing on this for the most part mm -hmm. but it was only it was only like a four minute set uh, did two brand new jokes that I'd never done on stage before. And yes, I was rusty, but I didn't get booed and I got a few laughs. So, you no, know, no, 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 that, that, that's a, that's a win. Cause I'm saying, you know, once, once you know what you're doing up there, you never lose that. Even if you are rusty, you don't, you don't, you don't lose knowing, you know, how to tell a joke or how to be who you are. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. But I was I was going for that bliss feeling because once I got off that stage, I was on like a high uh, <laughs> for like the next like at least three hours. I nice. had that adrenaline going. So that that right there is why a lot of people want to get up on stage right there. <laughs> Face the fear of public speaking and it pays off. But you know what it is? Uh, and that's a, that's a good thing about a fear because you took the risk and you won. <laughs> you have to, <laughs> yes. you got to have the same feeling when you don't win, when you do get booed and when they're like, yo, you suck. This ain't for you. Just don't quit your day job when you get that kind of response. Uh, and it's like, damn. This was a clear loss tonight. <laughs> or even for me, I'll have a couple good sets in a row and I'll start to feel myself and poke my chest out. And then I'll go out there and bomb hard. And I'm like, damn, I don't even know what I'm doing out here. Like, <laughs> <laughs> am I who I am? Am I even being honest? Like, you know, you know, like uh, it's, it's, it's a total up and down. <laughs> Do you deal with much personal stuff in your stand up? I mean, I try to like I, I, I try to talk about you know, the, the despair with my family, just typical stuff. Like 
a lot of people feel like the odd man out or like they don't fit in their family or like they go through crazy thing with their girlfriend or like uh, they tried some drugs like mushrooms or, you know, just just say. I, but I feel like a lot of people go through these things, but they're not honest about them. You know, they don't they wouldn't portray that on Instagram or they wouldn't uh, talk about that to their friends like or their people at work. So when they come out and see me, it's almost like uh, I'm bearing it all. Like I'm the the person who's that friend that you hate or that friend that you always talk about. Well, at least I'm not doing as bad as that guy. At least I'm not like that piece of shit. Like I'm that guy on stage. Like, yeah, I go through it. I know you go through it, too, because you're laughing and you feel this because it's real. OK, right on, man. So pull from experiences and like, yeah, so that's cool because only like that's the one thing that you can do that other people can't is you, you know? Yeah, um, so yeah, that I got to figure out how to get more personal on stage myself because like, I want to talk about some things, but it might get an awe response and I don't want that. Like I've been blind in my right eye since 2007. Um, but like, I don't want that pity there you know I so i gotta you. figure out how to get around that and not get that oh maybe be like yeah you know, i just like you did about your leg at the beginning of this so you're like maybe i deserved it <laughs> but <laughs> don't awe me I, uh, I i would say i would say the only thing i could say is just uh you could just talk about how being blind in your eye doesn't stop you at all like you're still a badass like you still get shit done like you know just just if, <laughs> if you're honest about how it it may affect you, but you still had to conquer it. Just you talking about you conquering it, I feel like it's funny. That's a good aspect to take. The one the one thing that I probably would have may have started out with though is like in the hospital, while well, it was still happening, I had to deal with had to use humor to deal with it. Yeah. And since I w- I went blind in my right eye, and I was like, man, I guess what they say about masturbation is right. Thank God I'm not ambidextrous. <laughs> <laughs> That is hilarious. That's like, listen, I call this myself, you know, like uh, that's making light of it, letting everybody know that you're cool. Now, nah, I don't feel like you would get all. So I feel like that's funny as hell. <laughs> and the funny thing is, I actually said that when I was in the hospital. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> uh, but enough about that, man. So let, let's continue on with these questions I got for you. Uh, what do you do to promote yourself currently? Oh, well, uh, for, you know, my stand up comedy. You know, I'm real big into Instagram and Facebook. Like, I try to, there's a lot of, especially on Facebook, there's a lot of comedy groups and a lot of social media groups. That's a good way, I feel like, to advertise yourself and to, like, just just have a concentrated group of people. That's, you know, that's the same way big companies market their stuff. Like, they don't just put out ads. They put an ad for this specific group of people. And I feel like that's a good way to go about it. And for the for the cartoons, you know, the way I chose to go about promoting my cartoons is I, I do commission work and in every you know cartoon that I do commissions for other people, I put my tag and my logo in there just to get the brand of my cartoons out. So then when my cartoon does come out, you know, it's like, oh, we do recognize this cartoon. And honestly, that's the that's the crazy thing that I've learned. And I haven't learned how to monetize this data yet, but yeah, people love it doesn't it doesn't necessarily matter if how can i put this it it does it 100 percent matters the quality of the product it 100 percent matters but when you put a product out on social media the it depends who posts it if one person posts it it might not get no love and if another person posts it there'll be a whole bunch of love under it and if a people if okay. people see a whole bunch of love under it they have no choice but to think, well, maybe I'm missing it. Maybe I don't get why it's hot. So I'm going to just act like I do and I'm going to say it's hot or I'm going to say I love it. I'm going to put some emojis just like everybody else did. Because that's one thing that's helped me a lot is like I'll do a free cartoon for a social media influencer. And, you know, I'll send it to them in their DMs. They like it. They'll post it and everybody in their comments because that's a, a targeted, you know, uh, social group. They got a million followers. So at least a yeah. hundred people, that's all I'm going for is less than 1%. But I know that number. 
but a hundred people will hit me up and out of that hundred people maybe 20 of them will get a cartoon but i know how much to charge them to keep myself afloat until the next 20 hit me up when you say you put your logo in other, when you're commissioned to do stuff for other people you said you put your logo and stuff in their piece that you could they commissioned you for or uh unless they explicitly you know tell me not to then yeah okay. you know i do either put it you know, at the beginning or like, you know, produced by this, animated by Shawnee Mac. You know, it's not throughout the whole video, but it is in the video. And if they decide to cut it out or not post that part, then that's up to them. But like in, yeah. in the one that they in the one that they get, it is in there. They do know who did the animation in the video. OK, so it's up front. So like when they're like. So your logo's up front, like when it's like produced by HBO right, or exactly. Netflix original yeah. type thing. All right, I thought you were saying you were hiding it in the image somewhere, oh, which was well, well. <laughs> I have I have done that. I'm not gonna lie. Like I, I I'll keep it honest with you. I I've uh, watched a couple videos on how TV does subliminal messaging, and it, it, it's yeah. it's really uh. It's really simple, like how how videos are produced, you know, it's either 24 frames a second, 30 frames a second. So in one of those frames, every six or 10 seconds, you just flash drink Coke or a Coca-Cola can. And then by the commercial break, you got the Coca-Cola commercial. And it's like, man, I think I want a Coca-Cola. And you don't even know why you're craving a Coca-Cola, but you've been seeing it subconsciously <laughs> in your mind. And and I have done that with pitching to the networks. Like I'll uh every couple seconds in one of the frames it'll flash Adult Swim or MGM. And I think it helps. I'm not gonna say that it does. I have no concrete evidence, but that's something that I have tried. <laughs> Interesting, man. That That'd be that'd be cool to try too. Too bad I can't do that with just audio unless uh, yeah, I'm just yeah, talking right. to you. Drink Coca Cola. <laughs> How are you doing today, man? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. But you know, I could just drop keywords somewhere. You know, like, like um, smart water. Uh, <laughs> but so, all right, man. That that's cool though. Trying to sneak in a little subliminal advertising every once in a while. <laughs> and the study of that would actually be pretty interesting to look into as well. So, um, now what would you say would be a highlight or two that you care to share with the uncontained audience? Mm, I would say one of my biggest highlights was, uh, performing at the Apollo. Uh, that was probably one of the bigger crowds that I ever performed at. And I'll say it's I'll say it's uh, one of my biggest highlights because I actually got booed and it was a really eye opening experience of me that really? I was a fraud, that I wasn't who I was on stage, that I was a character that I was trying to like I, I was 23 years old and I went up there in a suit like I was one of the kings of comedy. And I was just like, wait a minute. Why? Why? Like, it was a it was a eye opening experience. And. The reason I got booed, I'll tell you this. I started off hot. I, I'll, I'll hold okay. that to this day. I started off hot, but I did a, I did an improv joke where I decided to come at New York City. And I guess they took it as a cocky, uh, you know, who are you kid? But the <laughs> booze started raining down. I tried to fight him as best I could, but it was too late. But the, the crazy thing about it was I can see the people booing me. It wasn't like, boo, we hate you. It was like, come on, everybody, boo, we're having a good time. Let's boo this kid. <laughs> I was just like, damn, this is terrible. But after I went off the stage, I realized, like, man, like, I had to start over from ground zero. But I'm thankful for that because it, it, it showed me, like, if you're not who you are and you're not ready for this, you'll get ate a lot. So be ready. Yeah. And that, that has to be, like, I... I've never had the feeling of a whole room booing me. <laughs> um, I've had I've had the sound of disgust made yeah. by a whole room, but never never like uh, like the oh I can't believe he said that sound sound, but never just straight up boos. And that that has to be a unique feeling. I'll say this: it's way better than people not listening. And when people are quiet or they're disgusted or even if they don't like it, at least they're listening. When you when you've done comedy where I've done comedy, you're being ignored half the time. And it's like, oh, oh yeah. man, <laughs> why did you even come here? And I have to ask myself <laughs> that question, not them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So at least at least it is a response. Uh, but I'd be like just 
I, I don't know. I, I just think it'd be an interesting feel, feeling to experience. Maybe I have to go get booed by an auditorium full of people at some point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, maybe now, that's I, one of my I, life I, goals. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that's following your bliss. I, I would say that's a little cynical. <laughs> <laughs> That that's going after new experiences. Right. <laughs> all right, all right. So do you have do you have another one that you care to share? Or mm, I, I would just say, uh, you know, throwing my own shows in LA. Uh, uh, for anybody who might be listening to this that lives in LA, you know, I do my own show every Sunday in Burbank at the Burbank office, and this is actually the second show that I've uh, that I've produced in LA. And uh, my first show it went on for two years, you know. But we've relocated to this location, so we're hoping to keep it running. And just having the feeling of each week in and out, you know, I've been able to stay consistent and have this show where I'm producing and comedians get to come through and get to bless the stage and they get to feel comfortable and not feel like they're rushed to have three, four minutes. And there's always a good crowd for them. So I I, I just think of that as like a, a real big accomplishment and and i thank all the people that come through there because they've helped me you know stay afloat and live out here in la and be able to chase my dreams but that's just you know one thing that i'm really happy about nice man nice it's that's awesome that you're getting the support on that too so um what what's some of the biggest names that come through your show oh man as far as uh comedians you know we had a couple people from all deaf digital like teddy ray uh david lucas uh we had um ian edwards we had tony baker come through we had uh stevie brown cappuccino brown a lot of a lot of comedians that i see in the circuit that i feel like haven't really you know, broken up into that next level. They may have got one or two TV appearances, but they're not, you know, at that household name level, but they always bring a good okay. show. You know, they're always uh, hungry to come out and perform. And I and that's what I appreciate about them. Because we all, sometimes, you know, we do get celebrities in the crowd. Like uh, we had, you know, Ty Dolla Sign, who's, you know, R&B artist. We had Gary Payton come through. We had a couple porn stars come through. You never know who might be. Craig Robinson came through and was in the crowd one time you never know who might be uh who might be in the crowd and it's and it's just a uh, it's always a fun show nice dude nice um where where is that at again uh this is the burbank office it's uh it's in burbank it's uh it's right up the street from flappers if anybody knows where flappers is i don't know but uh it's called the burbank office and uh yeah you guys gotta look it up you can google google's really it's easy to find the address of anything so Yes, yes. Google it, Yelp it. You know, it's use the World Wide Web. It's a magical <laughs> thing. Um, so, all right, man. I actually just got a few more questions for you. Actually, just uh, two more questions for you. All right. So now, when somebody does come and see your show, Sean, uh, whether it's at the Apollo or in LA or your one at the Burbank office. Um, what do you want them to take away and remember about your show? Uh, I want them to remember that I had a lot of energy, uh, that I was saying something that I felt like, at least you could tell that I felt like I was trying to help people or better people. And I want, uh, I want it to be, you know, I want them to remember me being funny. Like they had, to, they maybe had to think about the punchline They maybe had to, oh, damn, I didn't know he was going to say that, or I knew he was going to say that. You know, I just pride myself on, yo, it didn't matter if it was 500 people or five people. He put on a good show. And that's what I feel like, you know, whenever people see me, they, they take that home with them. Bomb, good set, whatever. I give it my all. All right, nice, man. That's all you can do, really. Um, give it your all, throw it out there, and uh, let them take what sticks, you know? Yeah. But all right, Sean, I want to thank you for coming on the show today. I really appreciate you and uh, that uh, you dealt with all those uh, technical difficulties that uh, we had at the beginning of the show and still came back and talked to me um, that I appreciate that. And it's time for the final question, the title question of the show. Sean Connor, how do you live uncontained? Man, living uncontained, I feel like, you know, it is an in-depth question, but to answer it completely, I would say sacrifice is the biggest part of it. You know, 
uh, the it, it it taking that risk for that reward of feeling bliss is what it's all about. You know, sacri- you may have to sacrifice your time, relationships with people. And that's a big thing that I feel like living uncontained. You know, you can't put yourself in a box or other people can put you in a box. And that's that's not one way that you would want to live. But just like uh, to sum it all up about living all contained, I would feel like it's having the confidence in yourself to trust that even if you fail, you'll figure it out. Not that you won't fail because failing is how you figure it out. Because I feel like when you're young, you don't know what you don't know. So you don't know which questions to ask. But failing, you quickly learn, damn, I did that wrong. I did that wrong. I did that wrong. Okay, (laughs) Uh, I know where I'm wrong now. So when you fail and you study and you go back next time, you can correct the mistakes and, you know, find your way to success. But it's uh, that that to live uncontained, you know, for me, I, I would say. I know I've been preaching, you know, uh, you may have to sacrifice, but finding good people too, finding good people that you can love and they can love you and that you can care about and they can care about you because you, you really can't do it by yourself. Like I said, I, I didn't create the show myself. I had, you know, my partner, Aaron Monte, and he's been a very instrumental and in helping me whenever I hit a wall writing or helping me to structure it, like I said, even to bounce ideas off. It just, that's just so beneficial to have somebody that you can partner with and activate your wonder twin powers and go. But it's, uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> wonder twin powers. I like that. <laughs> but just, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's just, uh, it's, it's really, it's really cool to, uh, to, to, to have a buddy like that. And I'll say this, you know, I, I really want to thank you for having me on, Aaron. Thank you for sticking through the uh, technical difficulties. That doesn't always happen, but when it does, it sucks. Will you do me the final honor of signing off the show today? Definitely. Appreciate you having me on, Aaron. Like I said, I'm about to go hotbox my bathroom, and I'm Sean Connor, and I live uncontained. And that does it for another episode of Uncontained. Thank you for listening, and thank you to Sean Connor for joining me. And if you want to check out some of his stand-up and also his animation, make sure you check out his Instagram page, which is at Mac underscore comedy. That's S-E-A-N-Y-M-A-C underscore comedy. And I'll have that in the show notes for you as well. So you can just easily click and go. And uh, thanks again to Max Goldman for helping set this up. And uh, you can check out the podcast he works with, the Crack 'Em Up podcast and uh, Crack 'Em Up Thursdays at the Belly Room. So make sure you check that out. And uh, thank you again for listening, and until next time, live uncontained.